Welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. Through these sessions, we hope to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools. In learning from and working with local and international peers, the goal of the Australian Biocommons is to support Australian bioscientists to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. My name's Christina Hall and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Manager. Before we start today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We really appreciate those of you joining us live today. You'll have the opportunity to ask our speaker questions via the Q&A function on your dashboard and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This session will also be recorded and if you'd like to revisit it in the future, you'll find it on the Australian Biocommons YouTube channel, along with recordings of previous webinars and workshops. And we also hope you'll keep in touch to hear about future webinars via the channels listed on the screen. We're excited to have a very special guest with us today, Martin Dravinsky from Canada's Michael Smith Genome Sciences Centre at BC Canada. Martin works in bioinformatics, data visualisation, science communication and the interface of science and art. He applies design, both data and artistic, to assist discovery, explanation and engagement with scientific data and concepts. Martin is the creator of Circos and Hiveplots, and his information graphics have appeared in the New York Times, Wired, Scientific American, and on covers of numerous books and scientific journals like Nature and Genome Research. He's the co-author of Nature Research Points of View and Points of Significance columns. Today, Martin will show you how small changes to critical elements can turn a muddled figure into one that's clear and concise in his webinar, The Essence of Data Visualization in Bioinformatics. I'll hand over to Martin now. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's, uh, I'd like to say it's nice to see everyone, but uh, I cannot say that in this occasion. Uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who has submitted figures for uh, redesign. Uh, I explain things in terms of critique by redesign. I, I take things that people have made uh, or I have seen and I make edits to show you how I think uh, data visualization uh, should be approached. I hope that through these examples uh, you'll get a sense of some of the guidelines and some of the very core principles uh, that at least I think about when I look at uh, data and concept figures. There's a couple of resources that I'd like you to uh, um, look at uh, when you have time ideally. Uh, the points of view columns in Nature Methods uh, ran for uh, couple of years and, and distill a lot of what I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about. And also it's very difficult to have visual literacy without at least a little bit of uh, statistical and mathematical literacy um, and to brush up on your stats, um, regardless what level you're at, um, you should take a look at the points of significance columns that also run in nature methods. Now, to summarize what I think <coughs> good visual explanation or good scientific explanation is, uh, I would say this, is that it has a necessary degree of supporting detail. It uses as little ink as possible. Uh, here you would substitute as few words as possible if there was a verbal explanation. Um, for the purpose of encouraging the reader to have the largest number of relevant ideas. Uh, and in this case, I'm, I'd like to point out that you don't want to mislead someone. You don't want to give them large amounts of any ideas just the relevant ones. So let's look at a scientific explanation. Let's say you have a, a cat at home and it's behaving strangely as all cats do. And you wonder what, what's going on inside this animal? How is this animal behaving this way? What is the visual explanation that would address this question? Well, let's say this is it. Now this explains a lot, but as a good scientific explanation, it raises more questions. How did the alien get into the cat? And why is the alien not wearing any pants, for example? Notice what it doesn't show is where the alien came from, the name of the alien, and all of these other relatively irrelevant things for that first explanation. 
And do distinguish two things, the, distinct, the idea between encoding and design. The encoding is the graphical recipe to take data and transform it into shapes on the page. Uh, thinking in terms of written word, these would be the right words and phrases. But often that's not enough. Often you have a number of such encodings, you have a number of things you want to say. So to communicate these ideas and how they're related, you would use effective design, which you could think of as choreography for the page. The design, the encodings are your actors, and the choreographer moves the actors around and has them come in and out of the scene at appropriate times. Now, before uh, I start further, uh, I beg you to constrain yourself when you are drawing things. Uh, read this book. Uh, uh, although it's slightly old, it does make good points that rich and ornate prose is hard to digest, unwholesome, and nauseating. And I do not think anyone wants to nauseate anyone with the graphics, although it has happened before. For example, here. None of these elements need to have the degree of, of, of decoration uh, and, and tawdriness that they do. Cancer is a, as a disease. It is not a lottery jackpot winner. You do not need these uh, accentuating stars. What you want to do is you want to use as little ink as possible, as little color as possible, constrain yourself so that your figure can then accommodate more information if required. Take a look at these two uh, examples, uh, whatever they may be. Notice how the lack of ink in C and D, these little, this little white dot, is a very strong grouper, is a very strong element that groups C and D together. That dot might indicate C and D are in common or have something that they share. We don't know what. But the lack of ink there is sufficient to connect them. You do not need to use ink. You sometimes just need to not use ink to make your point. Now, when you're about to say something, when you're about to write something or draw something, it's pretty important to know the purpose of this activity. And so in that, you should try to find what the essentials are and discard all else, at least at the beginning for the first explanation. Uh, the running joke, at least in physics, is to imagine a spherical cow. Now, the reason why you want to imagine a spherical cow is because real cows are complicated and difficult to model and require complicated mathematics. But modeling a cow as a sphere is a good first order approximation. So if you have a bucket of cows, you just have a bucket of spheres. Notice here, for the physicists, the tail goes to zero. It is not important. So let's look at a figure, an isolated spherical cow. Well, this is really complicated, and you probably didn't get it right away. You have to look at it closely, and you can maybe figure out that these arrows that even though make it look like the chromosomes are sliding in and out like a door, really are meant to indicate that things are flipping around. So don't draw something with so many arrows. Specifically, don't draw arrows that tell me where to look. I know where to look. I really hate being told where to look. I'm generally going to look from the top down and from the left to the right. This redesign is really nice because while it doesn't show you a before, it shows you a during. So when you have this situation where you have a before and after, don't think about before and after. Think about during. I really need to, don't need to know what it looked like before. I can imagine. The curved arrow indicates motion. But more can be done. Genes don't have to have three letter names. Genes could have any name and therefore could have just a single symbol. Uh, notice the repetition, uh, notice the m dashes, rep repetitive, um, fusion 5 prime, 3 prime are repeated. We probably don't need all that detail. We can get away with writing fusion once. And what is important here is while the, this area is aligned, this break is aligned with this break, this m dash indicates that fusion and therefore it is centrally aligned with that fusion, whereas over here the m dash is not aligned with that fusion. This might seem like a very petty point to you, but if you are making a very large graphic and you're building up these ideas and you have lots of elements like this, the more you align, the more you associate spatially things that are related, the more the reader gets the idea of what the figure is about. Uh, this is also very critical, this idea of rearranging elements to find patterns and trends. Uh, why do I need to do this? It's because if the things are not in the right order, people will see 
things anyway. People will see patterns in random stimuli. It's called pareidolia. You probably didn't go to school to learn how to recognize faces, and yet you see one here in the clouds. So even small graphics can have this kind of level of confusion. Here is a small network. Uh, it really doesn't matter what it means, but you probably didn't get a, a sense of what the patterns between in the connections between the nodes are. Well, how would you, right? You have to uh, try to figure out the, the arrangements of, of these arrows. So what would be a way to, to address this problem? Well, when I looked at this figure, my first question was, why is the order of the nodes the way it is? Why is reverse uh, on the right? Why is forward in the back? Dorsal and ventral have anatomical uh, um, correspondences. Why are they both at the bottom? If I were to rearrange these nodes in a way that is a little bit more intuitive, forward is in the front, you know, then it's slowing, then reverse, and so on, you suddenly realize that the arrows form a very symmetrical pattern around this axis and around this axis. Now, that pattern was there before, but it's unlikely that any amount of software that you would use uh, to draw this graphic would say, you know what, if I just rearrange the nodes, these patterns would come up. This is a typical graphic uh, straight out of our a faceted plot, a bunch of plots. Uh, each shows some chemical and its level uh, in um, uh, fossils over time. So the x-axis is time from 1940 to 2000. Great. So what is the number, maximum number of relevant ideas that this graphic has given you? What have you recognized? What are you thinking about? You're probably thinking, well, now what? Now what should I do? I, I can see the data, I can see the trends within each plot, but how can I compare the trends across plots? Do not be afraid to punch out the fit, uh, discard the data as a first explanation, and then sort the fits uh, in a way that shows how the different curves relate to one another. Notice here that a bump forms, notice that they're all increasing over time, uh, towards the end, notice that this one drops as opposed to increases. There is a bump and this one has, has two bumps. It's unlikely that you would have recognized this very quickly from the original plot. Here's another example of this, and you may know exactly what it is that I'm going to do. Whenever you see an earth faceted plot or any kind of small multiple, ask yourself, why is it in that order? Can the order be improved? Um, and, and when am I likely to see something when the order is improved? Here are some plots of something. It doesn't really matter. Yes, this workshop is about data visualization and bioinformatics, but often when you think about your data in a more agnostic way, regardless of where it came from, what are the trends, uh, you can get a fresh perspective on it. So here's some axis, a divergent change, convergent change, whatever that may mean. Divergent change is orange, convergent change is blue, and yet all these panels don't seem to be in, in any order, certainly not of that axis. What if I were to rearrange these panels in the order of divergent to convergent change? Suddenly, the trend in the plots is obvious. Something happens here between Crozet and Bouvet. Right? These traces go up, all of these traces drop. Now, this might lead you to think of a hypothesis. Well, maybe there is some kind of a categorical difference between these three plots and these four plots. Maybe divergent change ends here. Maybe these are not divergent change. Who knows? The point is you are seeing patterns that you would have not seen in the original graphics. Here's something very straightforward from a poster. Uh, quick, do you see the trends? Well, the trends are hard to see because the zero line is at a different position in every panel. Instead, uh, combine all of those small multiples into a single graphic uh, where each of these is now a group, have a, a horizontal axis that is shared. In this case, um, to try to add a little bit of flavor, I've used green as a highlight. Uh, and the axis is green to indicate that floor level. Notice the stars, the stars, the uh, significant stars are often at the top of the bar. Think about the fact that they're hard to find. You have to hunt around for them. There's no one location in the graphic where those significance markers appear. Think about the fact that you might wanna move them 
say to the subtitle of each panel. That way you, your eye runs across the horizontal here and says star not significant, not significant star. I don't have to hunt around, uh, picking up the color of the accent. You may see graphics like this. Oh dear, there's a lot of bar charts here. And what are the trends? It's just impossible to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, of course, why is the order uh, what it is? Let's look at a couple of things that, that this figure could get better. First of all, the order of the tone is really strange. Wild type is gray, and then two of the interventions are lighter. One of them is white, and then this combination of interventions is black. It's a very, very unusual order. I suggest that the lightest gray is your wild type, is your control, and then successive levels of intervention uh, get darker colors, darker tones, possibly with the one that's most extreme having the darker tone. The other question is, do I really want a bar chart here? Bar charts use up a lot of ink, they use up a lot of space, they require that you start at zero if you're going to have error bars. What if you were to draw scatter plots? What if you were to draw scatter plots uh, starting really between 80 and 120 on the y-axis because this is where all the action is? And then what if you were to rearrange them in the same way we did before to highlight the differences and the trends? So suddenly things make a lot more sense. You realize, oh, well, uh, for example, these two are really similar, uh, and then these start to get similar, and then these two are very similar. And that's not something you would have seen before. In fact, if you want to take this a little further, you might remove the points, because there's only four points in every bar chart, and they all correspond to the same thing. And then you might take uh, profiles that are very, very similar and overlay them on top of each other, thereby only showing groups of plots. A lot of times, you know, bioinformatics has heterogeneous data. You have data from different experimental modalities and, and you want to show them all on top of each other. Uh, think of a, a genome browser where all the tracks are stacked. And you want to look at patterns. Does one track go up when the other track goes down? It's really hard to find all those. Help the user spot those by overlapping things. Suppose you have two tracks. So you have a copy number track and you have an expression track. And the stars indicate significance. So let's look at a way to try to combine these tracks together to help the user find relevant um, parts. And here, by relevant, let's say, uh, inverse correlation as, as, a, as, as an example. So the first thing that I'll do is I will take all the stuff that's not significant and I'll just fade it out. I'll make it gray because nobody wants to look at non-significant data if there is significant data. And I'll change the copy number to a scatter plot. So here they are side by side, but what if we were to put them on top of each other? There you go. That's still pretty visible. You can still read things. More importantly, if I color only the data points for copy number or expression, where there is inverse correlation, meaning one is high and one is low, and then remove all the stuff that's not significant, I wind up with this. And immediately you're drawn to this column, the disposition where there is an inverse correlation and all the other parts you're free to look at uh, at your leisure. This is something that's not often done, this idea of filtering away data that is uh, not significant, doesn't meet some threshold, because people typically like to see things in context. They like to see the whole data set. And that's very fair demand. But as a first explanation, if you're giving a presentation, I feel like showing the conclusion first and then showing your supporting information uh, is a really good way to go. Now, uh, I have to talk about Gestalt because if there's one principle behind all of these modifications that I've made, it is this. And the Gestalt is an organized whole perceived as more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it's German, surprisingly, because it's such a short word. This slide speaks for itself. Uh, please internalize this uh, and live out as if it's true. Now, let's look at these shapes you are very likely seeing rows of circles and rows of triangles. I know this because we're all humans and we're pretty much the same. What if I wanted you to see columns? Well, 
I could use space because space makes groups. See how hard it is to read this. Without knowing that, if I drew lines between those uh, columns to force you to see columns, you still see rows. Your eye goes straight over those lines. It doesn't matter. Those lines are nothing for your eyes. But if I start increasing the space, at a point, you now see columns. The space has broken up similarity of shape as a grouper. And this concept of grouping by similarity as a very powerful one and you can break it apart with space but you have to have enough space color also makes groups and it is very powerful but is not as powerful as space and the two are always at odds with one another so i can make you see a diagonal line i can make you see a vertical line i can make you see a point and at each of those levels i have uh, conscripted a more powerful uh, more salient uh, element, uh, tone, black, hue, and then a color that stands out more than others such, such as red. Notice that here you can see at your leisure rows of shapes, columns of shapes, a diagonal line, a blue vertical li line, uh, and a red dot. So how this plays out in, in, in the real world is that if you have a plot which uses a, the same tone of ink for many elements that are different, uh, all of these jumble together and you have a hard time telling apart where things start and stop. Uh, if you use different levels of gray, for example, you perceive the graphic as a series of layers. Each layer has its own uh, uh, importance, has its own role, and can be perceived independent of all the others. Well, this is a lovely chart, isn't it? What's going on? There's a, there's a lot of things here that aren't data. So it has broken the use as little ink as possible rule uh, guideline that I mentioned first. Let's see how we could use Gestalt to solve this. Notice that what we want to do is we want to group things. We want to group things by the occupancy. This is really basically a table. And what you're not seeing very well is the, is the rows and the columns because there are all these colored bars that are everywhere that are making everything look like one thing. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just get rid of all of those uh, spaces between, uh, colored spaces between cells, between rows and between columns. Already this is much, much better. But we do not need a different color for every row. In fact, what we probably need, because the rows are already being grouped spatially, and so the color as a grouper is ineffective there. What we probably want is we want to differentiate positive values from negative values. So what we'll do is we'll pick a color for positive, a color for negative. Magenta and, and blue are great. And there you go. And then there is a, a, a single a vertical uh, axis guide for the uh, zero position relative to transcription start. Uh, the uh, titles are uh, restrained. And you can very quickly see uh, areas such as, such as this, where there might be positive values but no negative values, the, where there are differences in positive values and negative values are great. Here you have two peaks, you have two peaks, very easily seen. Uh, here you have a symmetrical view, but here you don't necessarily have a symmetrical um, uh, profile between the positive and negative values. Uh, very powerful, I've used much less ink, I have only two colors. Gestalt, uh, one of the ways of, of thinking about graphics is what is in the foreground and what is in the background. This is a traditional example of, of looking at that. So when you see a bar chart like this and you have white bars, uh, the white bars, you can't distinguish the white bar between the spaces between bars. If you look at this too long, uh, you will go insane. So please, uh, always use some amount of ink in the bars and preferably no outlines because you don't need it. Don't worry, the ink won't spill everywhere. But when you draw a bar chart, always ask yourself, maybe I just needed a scatter plot. And then always ask yourself, maybe some of the points should be hollow because I can differentiate them more strongly uh, from black points than gray points from black points. Ask yourself these questions, try it out, see if it addresses your point. Uh, if it doesn't, back off. Here is a very poor gestalt. What is this figure trying to say? Well, you probably guess there are some compounds named such and their levels go up and down over a time course. The Gestalt problem is that things that have the same meaning do not have the same format. So for example, the text label is black here because it's on a white background, but here it's white because it's on a black background. 
this is not a good idea. All labels generally should be the same color. All data of a, the same family should be the same color if it is already spatially uh, uh, organized. Instead, I would draw something like this. I would give each track a light uh, gray background to indicate to you that yes, I have four things, four plots. Within that plot, you draw the curve of the level uh, in whatever way you would like. Uh, generally, this very linear, triangular increase and decrease uh, doesn't happen in nature. There are no such non-differentiable inflection points. Everything is generally really, really smooth. So draw smooth distributions. But what I'm also reinforcing here is with these vertical lines is what it is that you should be paying attention to, which is the position of the maximum of the curve. If I wanted to take this one step further, I might suppress these uh, time labels completely and only show the values at which these maxima occur. Thereby telling you that the values in between don't really matter, and that's important. I really don't care where four is. Here's another example of this idea of foreground background gestalt. Uh, if you look at uh, this um, molecule and hydrogen uh, bonds between uh, these bases, the, the, the rings, the hexane rings, are very similar visually to these shapes that are formed between the molecules where the bonds are no longer covalent bonds by hydrogen bonds. By filling the molecules in, you see more of the sense of there's two entities and they're separate and then they're connected or, or yeah, re uh, interact with one another through some kind of non-permanent interaction with these, dots, with these dotted lines. Here's another example where this happens. This is a synapse, but the concept of inside and outside the cell is very poorly made because everything is an outline and nothing is filled. Notice here how strongly the idea of the cleft, the, 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 the area between the synapse, within the synapse, between the, uh, the termini, and within the uh, end of the cell uh, is emphasized. And if you see here, if I remove that, that uh, fill, the figure spreads out. The figure no longer has uh, uh, solidity uh, on the page. Uh, notice if I remove the outline completely, even though there's a, no more of a sense of inside and outside of the cell, you still have very high degree of order of what is drawn because ultimately everything that was drawn was drawn with an arrangement in mind. This is very important. Uh, salience to pertinence. So salience is the thing that jumps out at you. Pertinence is the thing that you hope jumps out at you because it corresponds to something that is important. So if this graphic is about the uh, red circle, congratulations. If this graphic is about the gray square, you have to redo this graphic. Gray square is over here and that's probably not something that you saw first. So let's look at a sketch of a large number of things happening in this L, and you have to ask yourself, well, what is this about? What is the core theme of this? If I look closely, I, I don't know. Because many things are happening, there are many colors. Instead, this is about free cholesterol and the metabolism of cholesterol in the cell. So make cholesterol quite a salient uh, object, in this case the magenta circles, make everything uh, light or colorless, uh, and draw accordingly. The cholesterol comes in and it moves down a central axis because it's all about the cholesterol. Lateral movement here is not important, and then it accumulates here. I'd like to point out one small thing about this graphic is that is the legend. Look at these antibodies, CR3, MAC2, and so on, and they all play a role in these activities. And they all come together as a, as a family of four, right? Doesn't really matter which one is which. Think about using the legend in line and labeling things next to where they appear. Now, normally I would say where they appear first, such as here, but you don't need to do that because look how they arrange themselves in the membrane and how they give you the opportunity to place a label right next to them. And does it matter which one this is? Is this MAC2? Is it FC gamma? Doesn't matter, right? So you could kind of see what happens. They pinch off this vacuole and then they move off to the other side. So think about the fact that the legend doesn't have to be this way and, and separate the labels from the objects. 
now on the topic of legends 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 are like a map for the for the figure and and even though the map is not a territory uh getting the map right is important this is an incredibly simple figure there's 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 two plots here, a line plot and a bar chart. It doesn't matter what, what they mean. However, when I looked at this, my mind uh, became undone a little bit because I'm looking at guest stays. I see this plot, but it's, this is the growth rate for which the axis is over here. So the first thing that I see is the sec in the plot is the second thing in the legend and has its axis away from where the data is happening. At the same time, the orange bar chart is the guest stays, which has its axis here. There's no reason for that to happen. Now, why did this happen? Software. You plug into columns, you hit plot. It, it doesn't know that the important part of a data set is closer to the axis of another data set. So instead, do something like this. Here is your growth rate. Here's your axis. Here's your growth rate. And it's legend uh, item appears here right underneath the data here are your guest stays here are your guest stays and here are your guest stays quite simple uh, but uh, you have to pay attention uh, use color responsibly right so one time I was standing in front of a poster display and somebody says but but doesn't color make everything beautiful I mean shouldn't I he had a lot of color uh, and I might have said something like uh, that's a lot of color and I thought to do an experiment. So let's see if color makes everything absolutely beautiful. Uh, conclusion, uh, no. So when you are using a lot of color, ask yourself whether you need it. It's certainly not making it more beautiful, but it may be making it more confusing. What is this graphic about? I have no idea where the highlights. There's a lot of colors that are being used that are interfering with the emphasis, with the pertinence of the elements that are important. Uh, which are somewhere in here. So this is the graphic as it should have appeared. There's a network and there is a list of genes, orange appears, and somehow the nodes become colored by this list of genes. Okay, I get it. It's some kind of a filter. Then there's some kind of clustering and then the do uh, nodes that have been filtered by the list within the clusters are remain, all the other ones disappear. Great. Now you can fill in the details, you can fill in some of the annotations of what happens at every step. But the point is that even without using any words, just by using single color, you've made your point. Uh, if you have a favorite color, everybody does, put it away, use it in your spare time for communication. Uh, look into the Brewer palettes, which are very helpful. Uh, there's a great online viewer for Brewer palettes. For example, you might uh, go and you might find this red purple uh, color palette and you might use it as follows. Here you have some differentiation of cell progress and at each step uh, certain genes are active and you have to wonder why is this green? Why is the nucleus green? And why is this orange and then turns brown? What is the meaning of this color? Is it is the concept of more differentiation or is there something else? So let's assume that it simply means more differentiated. So pick a color scheme that smoothly uh, transitions across uh, tone or hue or some combination of the two, such as that uh, red purple uh, brewer palette uh, and draw it like this. Uh, do not use different color uh, for the nucleus. But also think about the fact that the, 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 the position at, at which um, different genes are active uh, can be seen as a set of labels, which are difficult to uh, compare, but that could also be seen as a table. Here's a table of genes and you can encode where they are active uh, in different ways, just as dots, maybe as bars of activity or bars where the label is inside uh, the bar. These kinds of oncoprints are very common. You have a large number of patients, you have a large number of genes that are mutated, uh, and you want to know whether the disease uh, phenotype uh, can be identified by certain gene signatures. And of course, you run out of colors really quickly, uh, and you have to, and then you just give up, right? Because there's nothing to be done, and I still have 50 more colors to assign. What I would do here is think about what are the most important colors. Certainly don't use colors as a background. Um, and in this case, because the colors are really needed in the mutations uh, area, uh, choose colors in which the most uh, deleterious mutations, the most harmful ones, 
therapeutic, possibly the most harmful ones such as multi-hit are the most salient and the ones that are synonymous, less likely to be meaningful uh, for, for the disease are less salient. Pick a color, stick with it. Uh, notice how uh, much like in the early example where I used a hollow dot to indicate similarity between elements uh, on the genome, um, these down and up triangles, which are very tiny, which uh, modify uh, some information about the mutation, have been changed into solid or hollow dots. That hollow dot is very, very effective. Uh, so the, the thing in bioinformatics is that you have a very, very big genome, and you have a lot of very small uh, features on this genome, genes, uh, uh, SNPs, uh, copy number variation. And when you try to draw things to scale, uh, you run into problems. Uh, here's a problem. Here's some methylation data, not to worry about what it really means, except that one is a patient, which is the orange, and the green is a uh, control. And then depending on the gene size and depending on how um, frequently the methylation value is sampled, you can get into these kinds of situations where you can't see anything. So I want you to think about letting go of this idea of a physical location of a data point uh, and approach it as follows. Uh, spread them out uh, regardless of where they are by order of appearance. And so now, of course, the big genes um, have a lot of data points and their little genes have very few data points. And these are positioned simply by order of appearance, not by their position. So here is, for example, a part of this gene. And the orange is the patient, and the black is the control. And now we go back to that example of uh, overlapping and coloring data to show unusual or unexpected correlations by making a few manipulations. You really only care about where the control and the patient are different. Where they're not different, it doesn't matter that much. So what I've done is I have colored the patient points magenta where they are lower than the control significantly and green where they're higher than the control significantly in all other places where the patient is not very different from the control it gets a black circle okay here all i've done is i've drawn a vertical line to connect the patient to the control this is just a visual aid it's not necessary however yeah, i can now remove the control completely why would I want to do that is because I don't care about looking at the control. I care about looking at the patient data. The magenta popsicles are where the patient data is lower. How much lower? This much lower. And the green are the popsicles where the patient data is higher. How much higher? This much higher. Uh, and here are the uh, leftover control points. And if I really wanted to encode the patient data where uh, near the control points where it wasn't significant, I could show a range. The nice thing about this now is I'm free to color the background based on some gene um, model, exon, intron, some other feature of the genome. I can even take them out of order and, and reorder them by size to get a distribution. Um, tables are very important. Tables are at the core of every effective graphic. Uh, the reason for that is because tables have a, a, a built-in, an inherent structure, spatial structure, rows and columns. They, they force you to organize things. And when you stop thinking about tables, you become more disorganized. I want you to think about always having some kind of a tabular structure as, uh, on your graphic, uh, at least in terms of even if it's just one row and one column, aligning things that are related. And so, no, it will not make you a psychopath, okay, just because you're looking at tables. It will actually uh, make, it, will, it may not make you friends because people don't like tables. But inside every effective graphic, I think, is a table trying to just get a bit of love. You know? A lot of graphics are not supposed to be graphics. They're supposed to be tables. This is not supposed to be a graphic. This is not supposed to be a stacked ring plot or whatever. This is supposed to be a table. This table should have a column type state origin transitions. This, the next column should be the subgroups of type. The next column should be the counts. And then a separate column, think of these bar charts, not as charts, but as entries in a table, but they're just graphical entries in a table. That's what this graphic should be. None of this. 
The beautiful thing about this is by looking at these bar values, you can see the distribution. Is it decreasing linearly? Is it decreasing in some other uh, way? Sometimes I, you know, I'll see things or somebody will send me something and my day is ruined because I have to spend it uh, redesigning it. So this is the best table I came across as a scientific journal. When I read that, I immediately thinking, most certainly it is not. Now, it's not the emojis that bug me in this table. In fact, the emojis are pretty much the only thing that keeps me from crying. It's the other columns uh, that are important because they completely hide the trends in this table. So these are different assemblers, uh, genome assemblers, and this is their, their runtime, min-max, uh, provided to you in the least intuitive and least easy to co uh, compare units. <clears throat> and the memory usage, uh, min-max, uh, uh, median. And the question is, well, what are the trends? What are the trends between runtime and memory uses? I mean, I sh surely there must be some trends here. Why am I looking at this table? Um, and so the whole, this, is, this is the whole table. So what I would have done uh, is this. I would have taken the assemblers and I would have ordered them by increasing runtime average. So now the runtime is not expressed to you in arcane time units, but expressed to you as an interval between the minimum, the maximum, and the average. And you could see that this, oh, right, so why are they ordered this way? It's because the runtime is increasing. Great. Notice that the emojis, the setup and usage emojis, have simply become minus, which is very, very unfriendly, and plus, very friendly. The OK level, the emoji that doesn't have a, any, any emotion, it, you don't need to show it because it's just fine. So if there's three, three states, you don't need to show generally the middle state, which is nothing to see here. But now over to the memory side, you see the trend. So as the runtime is increasing, the memory footprint is decreasing. And then suddenly it's increasing and then it's decreasing again. So Shannon has a very unusual uh, way of operating, which has a medium length runtime compared to others, but a very high memory footprint. No chance you would have seen this in the original table. Um, I will quickly run through a uh, handling a multi-panel image, and I believe that this will be the last example uh, before uh, we look at some questions. So, multi-panel figures, right? There's a panel A, B, C, and D, and so on, and there's a bunch of different things in these panels, and sometimes they're related, and sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're not even made by the same people. So, what happens when I look at this figure? How do I think I could um, fix it? Well, the first thing that I see are these boxes around these protein structures. Uh, they must go. These boxes do not help organization and always think of boxes like jail for data. You do not want to put innocent data in jail, so don't use boxes. They never help. These uh, uh, box plots are, are very, very big. In fact, I wonder whether we need more room for these nice protein structures and less room for these box plots. There's a lot of duplication. There's a lot of these brackets. Of course, I know what that means. It's associated with label. There's a lot of duplication. N equals, N equals, N equals is repeated. There is this idea of the long terminus, which is this uh, red tail and a short terminus, which is carried through uh, over here in red. But I have also red here, which isn't that important. And there's other colors that get in the way of removing the meaning of, of the color as associated with the length of the tail. So the first thing I would do is remove the boxes. Already, this figure is much better. It's still fine. Nothing is, nothing is fallen out of place, and you are not confused by anything. It's just that a lot of these constraints are, uh, have been removed. Next thing I would do is I would take these uh, uh, structures and I would change the color to blue because red I always associate with something that's bad uh, or negative, an outcome related to disease perhaps, and I find that uh, using that color for those purposes is, is, is intuitively better. So I pick blue because it's a value neutral proposition. I changed the tone a little bit of the structures of the proteins uh, and I have added a stronger outline to them so they stand out from the page a little bit. Uh, and these minor modifications just increase the contrast around the edges. 
So instead of something like that, I would have something like this. Notice that the labels are very close to the thing that they're labeling. Here's the residue, here's the label. Here's the residue, here's the label. Instead of here's the residue and the label is all the way up here and it's all the way down here. Okay, so you try to bring those labels, bring those legends as close to the uh, thing that they're labeling as possible. For these box plots, well, what are we gonna do for these box plots? We're gonna make them a little bit thinner vertically. And then what we're also going to do is in this legend uh, that shows you what the box plot corresponds to, what kind of uh, length arrangement and, and domain arrangement they are, because they're actually all the same. It's N followed, it's the nitrogen N, it's followed by something, followed by tap C. So I'm going to break that out of these structures and have this hollow box. And this structure is the thing that is in the hollow box because there's no need to repeat N terminus, C terminus, and so on. Also notice what's happening is a little tricky is that this first box plot in panel B and this first box plot in panel C are actually the same box plot. It's just that in this case, it's being compared to this, and in this case, it's being compared to that. So why not compare them at the same time? Sample size, so it's a column N. Here's a sample size. P-value, it's a column. Here's the P-value. Uh, enthalpy change, I believe that's what that is. Uh, I think, I'm not sure exactly what the H is in this context uh, is here. It may have something to do with confirmation change. And finally, the last panel where uh, there is an association between the length of the terminal and the uh, half-life of, of, of the confirmation, I believe, of the protein, uh, I would draw something like this. I would show the half-life if I needed to. There's, there's very, if somebody, it's good to have a good, a quick explanation of a concept, but presumably if somebody's looking at this plot and doesn't know what a half-life is, then they probably don't know a lot of other things that are important to understand the plot. It's, I leave it to your discretion to, to, to explain the concept of a half-life, but let's say you, you need it to. I would drop it off to the side, combine these three half-lives, and I would end their uh, trace exactly next to the plot. Uh, and this works out quite nicely. Uh, here, I would emphasize the fact that this is the short uh, chain uh, and this is the long chain. Much like this, except I would not put this ellipsis here. It's very obvious what this means, that this corresponds to short, this corresponds uh, to long. Uh, notice also there is no data beyond 50 or close to it. Then there is no need to put 60 on the uh, axis. Unless, in a very specific case, where 60 is the physical universal absolute maximum for this chain, and somehow it related to uh, a cutoff that was brought up in the paper or, or in the context of these slides previously. If 60 was a magical ceiling, then yes, there would be reason to include it. Uh, and here's the difference between the two plots. I think that the second one is clear and it uses less space. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've learned something that you can take to your own work. Uh, and I hope you are going to spend the rest of your day removing colors and removing boxes from around your data. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Martin, for the fascinating journey into data visualization. I've never nodded so much listening to a talk. There are some questions from the audience that we have a few minutes now to address. And if anyone else would like to ask Martin a question, please write it into the Q&A box now. If we don't get to any particular questions live, Martin's agreed to address those afterwards offline and registrants will be sent the answers in writing at the same time they're notified of the recording becoming available. So are there any questions there, Martin, that you'd like to pick Yeah, from? so uh, this always comes up and people ask me such as this, what is your favorite software for, for data visualization, uh, plotting and generating tables? Uh, in other words, you're asking me, how do I do uh, what I did? Uh, I would say that if there's data, I would uh, either, I would use R, uh, whatever you may feel of R, uh, about R, it, it does create plots. 
uh, save as a PDF, uh, get it out of R as soon as possible, and then into Illustrator. Uh, alternatively, if uh, the process of making the graphic in R is unnecessarily complicated, I would script it, create my own SVG file, and then get it into Illustrator. So everything essentially converges and bottlenecks in Illustrator. Illustrator allows me to adjust uh, the position and weight of all the different elements. It allows me to think about the physical size of the final graphic and how big each of those elements will be relative to that physical size. Uh, instead of Illustrator, you can use something like Affinity De Designer. Uh, it's, it's quite good. Uh, it is not free. I would advise against using Inkscape. Inkscape is free and uh, open source free software is fantastic. But in this case, if you're going to be spending a great deal of time in front of the, soft, the, 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 the software, um, Inkscape is, is slow. It's a little bit awkward. And when I tried to use it, it frustrated me uh, more. And uh, do not, do not uh, worry that you must learn the same software that others are do or, or know to create something. Uh, you don't. You have to become good at something that's flexible enough that lets you explore things without distracting you with endless features. Uh, you, you have to hone in your, your vision, and that takes time. Uh, takes time to figure out your style, takes time to figure out the message between you, behind your data, um, and do not have the fear of missing out to that. Well, if I'm not using Blender, uh, then my graphics suck. That's probably completely not true. Um, so there's another question about software you recommend for figure creation. Um, I'll add to that. There are some online utilities that let you quickly create graphics. Uh, for example, box plots. Um, there is an online box plot generator that um, you can uh, find by Googling, I think, online box plot generator. It was published in Nature Methods uh, in the same issue as we talked about box plots in our points of significance column. It's essentially uh, just an interface to uh, R through Shiny and lets you cut and paste the data very easy, gives you a bunch of box plots, gives you the figure legend, actually, which tells you that it's a certain kind of box plot, a Tukey style box plot. This is the sample size, which uh, always remember to give you the sample size when you're drawing box plots, otherwise they're meaningless. Um, and they probably, it, and, and it does a couple of other things to help you. If you want to alternate colors, for example, in groups, you just type in red comma green, and, well, red comma green, actually the worst possible color choice, a gray comma dark gray, um, and it will, uh, color them automatically. So you can very quickly configure the box plot, save as a PDF, and you're done. Um, uh, any guidelines, website references that you recommend? There is a million uh, things to look up. Uh, there are good examples that are done daily in the New York Times, for example. Look at what the professionals do and try to shamelessly copy them. Uh, don't copy the data, but, but copy, copy the style. Uh, read the points of uh, points of view. They were written by a variety of people. They have really good points to think about. And and uh, get into typography. Get into typography because typography and and the art of of formatting text is at the core of almost all visual communication. At least it was for a very very long time. And then we added this ability to to draw scatter plots, but. In there, there is still text, and text has very much to teach you about how to organize yourself on the page, and for that I recommend Bringhurst's Elements of Typographic Style. And of course, you can uh, read Tufti, you can go to one of the many you know, online data blocks about, about data. Um, one thing that I would not uh, suggest is that you, in, you, you read things like our tutorials to learn how to approach data viz because what they're going to be is recipes for cooking very specific things. And if you want a very specific things like a, a heat map that's been clustered, okay, look at that tutorial. But don't look at that tutorial and get bogged down in the syntax of ggplot to try to understand the purpose of things like a heat map and coding or and where it's good and where it's bad because you're going to get uh, stuck in the weeds too much. Any thoughts of violin plots? Uh, so violin plots uh, which uh, with box and whisker plots don't or kill them with fire. 
our violins burn very quickly. So if you need to kill them with fire, uh, although that's probably a very bad metaphor to use at this time in Australia, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, violin plots are essentially box plots, but the size of the points at a given uh, value is is been convolved with some kind of distribution, some kind of a kernel. And so you get a box plot that has a shape that reflects how many points there are inside uh, that point in the box plot. Eh. I am uh, lukewarm about it. I think violin plots are one of those things where the data might demand it or the, ma the data might not care about it. If everything is a normal distribution, if it is actually, then a box plot is pointless. You just draw the, the standard deviation uh, or standard error if you care about the precision of the mean and the mean or the median. But if the distributions are very, very unusual, and you want to demonstrate that they are, fair enough. Just keep in mind that whatever, whatever uh, kernel you choose for your violin plot may smooth out all those um, interesting bits in your distribution uh, to, and make all the violin plots suggest that there is less fluctuation in your data than there are now. Now, when I say suggest, I guess I, I'm thinking about people who don't quite know what the algorithm of creating those violin plots was. Uh, if they do, you're safe, but be wary of giving the reader uh, unproductive ideas. Um, I've had a reviewer who was colorblind and therefore I had to change my figure colors to colorblind friendly colors. Color wise in figures or papers, should we use colorblind friendly defaults, uh, colors by default, how can we best show contrast? Good question, yes. So. Colorblind. There's a variety of color blindness because we have three different kinds of photoreceptors, and of course, there's a group of people with deficiency in at least one of them or more. Right. The most common ones are the deuteranopes, who are believed missing the medium length photoreceptors, and they can't distinguish red and green very well. Okay, and for the most parts, these are uh, men, huh? and uh, there's about five or four percent of total population has got some degree of color blindness. Great, don't use red and green. Whenever you are picking colors, pick red and blue. Uh, add magenta to every color. This will help distinguish between red and green. So I wholeheartedly suggest that you never use red and green to uh, as a combination. To increase contrast, uh, line weight. Uh, don't draw lines that are very, very thin. Draw lines on a page at least half a point. In width and for data traces, uh, one and a half points or thicker. Um, remember, contrast can be achieved by placing boxes around things, but it can also be achieved by space. Space is, is the color of the page. So let's say it's a white page. Uh, there will be contrast between the margin, the space, the white area, and your color. Uh, keep in mind that there are some colors that may not produce well if they're very light, such as light gray. So avoid using very light grays in uh, slide presentations because the projector uh, may wash them out. There are ways to simulate color blindness without having to find a colorblind friend and having uh, likely him to ask to look at the figures. There's something called Color Oracle, which is free, which you can download for a Mac or PC, and it will transform your desktop and it will apply a filter to everything and show it to you the way that colorblind people see it. Um, I strongly suggest you at least dabble in that to really get a sense of how little room you have to maneuver you have to maneuver when you are thinking about color blind friendly designs. One of the points of view columns is about color blindness. I have a section on color blindness on my webpage. If you just Google my name and color blind, you'll get to it. And there are some color palettes that are there that are, are color blind safe and have other features that uh, I encourage you to um, read. And the point, I'm just gonna make one, one more point with this question, the idea that I had a reviewer who was colorblind. Uh, yeah, there are two people who want to read your paper and understand it, the two reviewers, right, or three. And you have to do all you can to not confuse them or upset them or uh, make them frustrated. And so it isn't just about colorblindness, it is all forms of communication. They are probably going to look at the figures and get a sense of what's going on. And if your figures are really clean and tidy, they're going to feel like they have confidence in you for organizing things out well. If your figures are scattered and disorganized, then uh, they're going to have an uphill battle in front of them and, and may not, uh, that may not put them in, in the best mood. Um, I will, I, I think we are running out of time. So there's a few more questions um, and I will 
make sure to post uh, answers to those, uh, including the ones that I verbally answered. I, I, will, I will type out an answer uh, and then pass them on to Christina, who will make uh, them available to everyone. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That is all, time, all we have time for today. So I'll once again express our appreciation to you, Martin, for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'd also like to acknowledge that Martin's Australian trip has been made possible by the support of the Australasian Proteomics Society. He'll be participating in the Australasian Data Visualisation and Bioinformatics Workshop and Symposium in association with the 25th Annual Lawn Proteomics Symposium. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge our funding organisation. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you found it useful. And until next time, goodbye.